can you introduce yourself and um, and uh, tell me what your profession has been and when you started? My profession is an Alaska commercial fisherman, and uh, my name is Michael Jackson. I've been fishing up in Alaska for 41 years, and I've fished in all sorts of different fisheries, but currently the only fishery I'm involved in is the Bristol Bay Drift Fishery. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was it like when you first got to Alaska? What were your impressions? When I first got to Alaska, it was as wild as I'd hoped it would be because I was as wild as I was. I was 18 years old and knew no limits. And that's what Alaska is good at is letting you find your limits. I, uh, I did whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, however often I wanted and learned a lot along the way. Well, that must've been entertaining for you and your friends and family. For everybody involved, yeah, but I'm not alone. I think I'm one of whoever goes up there. Alaska is the land of misfits and I fit right in as a misfit. Mm -hmm. And you, you started fishing, which a lot of people do. And how did that happen? I started fishing because where I went to school in Tacoma, Washington, there was a number of families that were fishing families and they were friends and they would go up and make money during the summers and come back. And I, uh, I wanted to do that. After I graduated, I wanted to make some money. I had the climbing trip in, in mind that I wanted to pay for. So I went up and once I did it, I, it wasn't for the money anymore. I mean, you can fish to make a living, but I found out right away that I was going to fish to make a life. And I, and I have. What did that mean to you? You know, what do you, what do you mean by making a life on the last frontier? I think anytime you can be involved in passion in your life, you're going to live and, and you're going to be the best you. If you have passion involved with what you do, uh, you're going to push the limits on what you do. You're going to be, you're going to be actively engaged and involved 24 seven, 365. And that's what it did. I was young. I was healthy. I was surrounded by young, like-minded, healthy people. And for me, it was an adventure as much as it was a way to make money. And I never, ever felt like I was going to work. I felt like I was going on an adventure and coming back with money. And I was doing it with friends and meeting new friends. And it's no different now. I mean, there's different financial obligations, different limitations on what the body can do. Um, things have changed, but it's still an absolutely amazing place to go. There is just, there's just nothing like it. Nothing. Tell me about Bristol Bay. Tell me about the fishery. Have you ever been to Burning Man? No, I haven't, but everybody I know has. It's just that I, I was working while they were getting high and doing what they did. Okay. You know? what, what, what a Bristol Bay fishery to me is never having been to Burning Man, but having seen films and talking to people, Bristol Bay is, is to fishing as Burning Man is to a festival. It's, everything is amplified to a level of craziness that is almost incomprehensible. The hours are insane. The weather is insane. The, the type of conditions you're put in working around different boats in close quarters is crazy, but it somehow it all works. Through that whole frenetic maelstrom, it all just kind of filters out and works. And that's what it's like. There is no two days the same in Bristol Bay. And I've done lots of fisheries all over. And really Bristol Bay is, it's one off for just the extremes of what it is volumes of fish that come in in a minute, you'll get 10,000 pounds of fish in one minute in your net. Where else does that happen? You'll have 10 boats within 100 feet of you bumping into you, trying to make the same set, get your net in the water that you're doing. Where else does that happen? But it all works. For some reason, it all works. It's mother nature at its absolute finest and it's human nature at its absolute worst. Wow. Well, I've been there and I was blown away. Um, so well, I'm sure we'll get into all that. Oh, tell me about the sockeye because of, of all the species of the stocks of salmon, sockeye seem to be kind of the pinnacle of the culinary world and command the most price and things like that. And they're, they're maybe in some ways the most the most unique to, to Alaska because down, down in the lower 48, you know, they'll spawn in lakes and things like that. And there's not as much, you know, there's not as much production anymore. Yeah, we've kind of taken care of uh, 
their habitat down here. We've, we've robbed them of the chance to thrive. But in Bristol Bay, they thrive, thrive they do. We're setting record runs, historical record runs. Sockeye do, do really well when they have diverse habitat. And Bristol Bay has, in, the, the habitat in Bristol Bay is incredible. A creek here, a stream there, a pool of water there, and all of it works together to give the diversity that the sockeye thrive in. And they're, they're prized in the marketplace because of the color, the texture, and the flavor. And the color is ruby red, the texture is firm, and the flavor is wild. It is absolutely wild. They're plankton feeders, which gives them that red color. And because of that, the flavor you get from a sockeye is distinct and unique. Aren't Chinook also plankton feeders? Chinook are opportunistic. They'll mm -hmm. take what they can get. And their, their flesh isn't firm in the same way. It's got more oil content, more fat content. So it's a lot of people like that flavor. For me, it's a trade-off between the consistency of the meat and the flavor. And I prefer the firm flesh of the sockeye. Mm -hmm. Do you have relationships with chefs, like in the lower 48 or in other places of the world that you know you either ship to or you talk with chef tom douglas is a, a i would i would say he's one of the biggest advocates for wild salmon and particularly bristol bay wild salmon he's a seattle area chef with a number of restaurants and he's been an advocate against pebble mine for years he has invited me onto his cooking show a couple of times on the radio to bring down bristol bay sockeye and talk about it um and it's just a it's a treasure that we have him in this area as an advocate for Bristol Bay and for Sockeye. Uh, a number of other chefs I've been involved with in the Seattle area doing promotions for Bristol Bay Sockeye. And then I am a direct marketer of Fall Line Fisheries, directly from me to you. And I deliver to restaurants and homes in the Bellingham and Western Washington region. Back in the day, I don't know if anybody told you about me, but in my filmmaking life, I, I made a film on the Elwha River. Back well, before, Sue told me that, yes. Back before it was a, a, a possibility. In fact, one of my life lessons is that things are, that people call impossible are not necessarily impossible. It just yeah. it depends on your, your, you know, your, your drive, your passion, your <laughs> relentlessness. Your timeline. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> what, I'm, no you're, well, like you, when you started fishing, I started filming right at the optimum time when I was just like, perfectly in shape and you know yeah and, and really ready to handle everything so that's that i told sue i hiked up to the glaciers you know with a 60 pound pack and a french film camera on my shoulder and the thought of doing anything remotely similar now is just not not possible i kind of think that i was crazy you know a little crazy. no you were crazy you were young and that was the right thing at the right time i get it yeah so um well you, you mentioned the pebble mine in the context of, of the, the culinary um, uh, yes. market. Yes. And wow, that's really unusual. So down in Seattle, you have people that are involved in the restaurant business that are really concerned about a mine that's being built up there. So why are they concerned? The mine that they're proposing in Bristol Bay is at the headwaters of the most productive sockeye river system in the world. We set, as I mentioned earlier, we set records. Why are they concerned? Because what the mine proposal is, is for the largest open pit mine in North America with a mine design that's never been tested in this kind of seismic train and, hydro and hydrology. It's underwater and it's getting shaken. It's like trying to build a mine on top of a dryer and shake cycle. Uh, the risk reward ratio is just, it's, it's unforgivable to even think about it. There is no way that this mine can, can survive. And so the chefs recognize that in order to sustain this wild run, they need to be advocates for this area. And so their motto is to save Bristol Bay, eat wild sockeye. Because the more people eat it, the more they get emotionally invested and the more they understand how special it is. I read in the New York Times today that there's gonna be a congressional investigation of the uh, practices of uh, permitting and the promises that were made and they weren't necessarily coherent and it's the article said they were speaking to two different audiences and one of them was the 31 villages of native people dependent on salmon for their sustenance around bristol bay and the other is the investors correct yeah they peddle a 20-year mine plan 
to the Army Corps of Engineers and to the local residents, and they say it's a small footprint, but they never have had to do a financial feasibility study. A 20-year mine wouldn't even begin to pay for the infrastructure. So it's a bait and switch by a foreign mining company that has absolutely no intention of developing this mine. Their goal is to get the permit and to sell it off. And we, all of the fishermen, the fisherwomen, all of the locals, the subsistence fishermen, the sports people that come in, all of us are taking the risk for them to make money. And it's an unacceptable risk. There is no way they can justify this risk the science that they're using to get the permit is junk science. It's been debunked by all major scientists that look at it that aren't getting a paycheck from the Pemble Limited Partnership. The data that they submit to the Army Corps of Engineers as fact is not peer reviewed. Their stream studies, their hydrology studies, they're their own scientists that do these and then submit it to the Army Corps of Engineers as fact. And the Army Corps, acting in collusion with Pebble Limited Partnership, is accepting this. They are ramrodding it through. So the process is fatally flawed. It's, mm -hmm. it's just been a travesty. To, to hear that, uh, that the two senators are, are operating in a way that's going to shed some light on how crooked this is just warms my heart. Because it, the only thing... The only way bad things happen is in the darkness. We need to bring this out to light so people can understand just how corrupt this is. What is the uh, foreign mining company that you're referring to and uh, where are they from? Can you tell us a little about, about their the, operating the structure? parent organization that owns the Pebble Limited Partnership, which is the boots on the ground company, Pebble Limited Partnership, is called Northern Dynasty. It's a Vancouver, uh, Canada-based company. Its its only assets are this these this mine claim, and they've borrowed billions of dollars to get this thing up and running. And the past few years, a lot of that money, millions and millions of dollars, have gone towards lobbying efforts for congressmen and senators to kind of pave the way to look beyond the science and allow politics to get into the process. It's it's. Uh, it's one of the last big fights that we have to protect one of the wonders of the world. And it, it breaks my heart to, to, to talk about it. It absolutely crushes me to, to realize that it's been 15 years we've been in this battle and we're no better off. My sons at 21 and 18, who had fished with me for years since they were 11 and 13, they decided to get their own boat permit up in Bristol Bay. So they took out a loan, they struck out, and they did that based on the fact that they saw what kind of a life they had growing up. They loved being outdoors. They loved being in the wild. They loved harvesting a resource sustainably. They loved the people involved, everything about it they loved. And so it, for me, this pebble mine fight took on a generational fight because no longer, we weren't just fighting for myself or my kids. I'm fighting for their kids. Yeah. And their kids' kids. And so that that is what I bring to the battle is it's, this is generational. And I've been to Washington, D.C., talked to Senator Murkowski, Senator Sullivan, senators from the Washington, and that's the message that I bring to them is, you may be bowing to pressure in the moment, but your grandkids' grandkids will never forgive you if this mine goes in, because they will never get to see what we got to experience. And we have just talked about the Elwha River. And it seems as if the moment that we're in right now is very similar to 19... 10 or 12, when non-local capital came into the region and uh, investor interest did not take into account native populations or community values. And they promised something that they didn't deliver. They promised that they would put in fish ladders when the dam went in, but they did not have the technological expertise to build those fish ladders. That was actually the basis of the hatchery system in Washington. That was the president, precedent. So it didn't really take much to set uh, a long-term precedent that affected many, many rivers. And the trade-off is, what, has it been 100 years now? It has trading, been 110. Trading cheap energy for a sustainable resource, which is exactly what they want to do with the pebble mine in Bristol Bay. And you cannot trade a sustainable resource 
for uh, harvesting a resource that will run out and leave permanent pollution. It's called forever mitigation. You have to mitigate that tailings pond forever. And once the money's gone out of, of the mine, what's the incentive for that mining company to maintain that mitigation, that forever mitigation? There is none. Dude, you're so, so right. Uh, this is like all my films rolled up into one, the way you're talking about. Because I went down to the Mojave and they're building solar energy projects or had been building them the last five, 10 years, meaning they're taking five to, five to 10 square miles of land and grading it. So there goes your ecosystem, there goes your carbon sink, there goes your biodiversity, there goes your people, there goes your native landscape and your burials and villages and everything else. And they're breaking, I don't know how many, countless laws. It seems to be an economic structure that, that, is, used, that is defeating environmental values at almost every turn in the United States. It's environmental alcoholism. This time will be different. Mark Titus, a good friend of mine, created a film about this pebble mine called The Wild. And it, uh, and it chronicles his personal journey with substance abuse and how it parallels the, the ecological abuse and how you bargain with yourself and how it's going to be different this time. And it never is. It just never is. It's the same thing every time unless you decide to put a stop to it. All of the fishermen in Bristol Bay, the local populations, the sports people that come in, everybody is fighting this mine. Nobody wants it except a foreign mining interest. And unfortunately, the governor of the state of Alaska is, he is resource driven and he is all for this mine. He is pulling out every stop he can. Well, the lesson on the Elwha for me was that progress isn't always what we think it is. And what they said about the Elwha, what my historical consultant said was before science improved the river, you had entire communities um, uh, driving food stuff, stuff from that river and surviving depressions and recessions. But after science improved the river, there was nothing in that river that would contribute toward a subsistence lifestyle. Correct. Yeah, I mean, the Luddites weren't wrong. They weren't against anything. They were just warning that modernization was going to take away a way of life. And, and that's exactly what happens. You're trading off a way of life for a perceived convenience or perceived wealth that's short term. And I'm no, not only no, hell no. There's lots of, there's lots of me's. I'm a big guy. There are bigger guys than me and we, we are in the way and staying in the way. Uh, can you tell me about the, the fisheries group that you are vice president of and board member of and what that is and what, what, what you, you bet. I'm, I'm a board member on the Bristol Bay Regional Seafood Development Association, which is a marketing association for all the Bristol Bay drift fleet. There's 1800, well, 1850 or so permits. And we self assess ourselves a 1% tax. And with that tax, we take on marketing projects, we take on sustainability projects, such as studies on habitat restoration, um, run timing, we work on quality issues because we want to get the most value out of our fish so that our members can get the most return on their investment. So it's a marketing uh, organization that does more than just market. And, and the past few years, we've taken a very hard stand and put a lot of money into legal battles against the Pebble Mine because that's the number one concern for our members. I see. And you said um, originally when we talked that 85% of the membership is highly concerned about the mine. Where, where do the other 15% come down? What are, what are their perceived values? I don't want to- Are they pro-business or pro-mining or pro-extraction in general, or how do you characterize- I can't them? speak to them because I can't speak with them because we're so far apart, I can't find a middle ground with them. The arguments that I've heard is Alaska is a resource extraction state. This is a resource, we need to extract it. They don't see the, they don't read the science that I've read. They don't follow what's happening with the politics that's absolutely corrupting the project. And so I think that they see the worth as more taxes into the coffers and more money. And for me, it's, there's not more money. There's less money. When you have to pay for every remediation, you go backwards in a hurry. Look at the state of Washington. Why do you think Senators Cantwell and Senator Murray are leading the fight against Pebble Mine? They're leading the fight. You know why? Because they've seen what happened in Washington with the mines. Habitat restoration costs millions and billions of dollars. 
How about habitat protection? That costs nothing but willpower. And that's what we need is that willpower to keep fighting and get permanent protections for Bristol Bay. Well, it's wonderful that you have that clarity. And unfortunately, based on a lack of clarity in the past and an awful lot of um, destruction, what do, your, what do your sons think about this? I mean, how, how is it different? Is it different at all for that generation? Or is everybody sort of in lockstep across, across generations? They're against the mine. I don't want to speak to them as far as activism level because they, they're not me. They don't have that same personality. So <laughs> they're, they are far more intelligent than I am, but they're far less vocal. So how they help out is different than how I help out. Mm -hmm. Your interview is going to be seen in New York for starters and distributed outward from there. So we're talking about a group of people who sometimes don't have much exposure to the natural world. And we've talked about the Elwha quite a lot. Um, what would you say to them as far as uh, the relevance uh, to their lives living in an urban environment and being farther away from a place like Washington or Oregon or Alaska, Montana, you know? That's, that's a really good question because I've traveled throughout the country in the fight against Pebble Mine, trying to make it relevant to people that you're describing that don't have that similar sh shared experience. And I'm trying to get an emotional attachment with them so that they can understand. So instead of me telling when I'm in front of people, I'll ask what's important to them. I'll ask, what is it that, that feeds your soul? And if I get a hand or two and trickle up, and I'll go, what if, you, what if that was threatened? What if that was threatened forever? And it didn't have to be. How does that make you feel? And that starts to get the lights going and the conversation could come up. So what I would tell people in New York City is it's no different than if they decided that, that uh, Central Park really, really, really needed to be turned into a parking lot. And it's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but we know better. And, and it's really important that we do this and the parking fees are gonna to go to this company that I own. And you know, I'm really sorry, but that's just the way it's gonna be. Alaska is a resource extraction state and they, they are really, they, they're all about trying to get the worth out of the land and the waters, fishing, mining, logging. Uh, but there's certain elements within those different resource extractions that recognize that they need to make it generational and sustainable. And so some of the laws that have been enacted recently are gearing towards that. It's not just take it and run. It's, hey, look, we wanna, we wanna plant again. We wanna keep fishing here. So I think there's an increasing awareness about the environmental stewardship. And I think the youthful generation, like my sons and, and kids, their kids, young men and women their age, they recognize that that's where they fit in, is kind of shepherding that environmental stewardship and, and finding a voice for that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, they, they certainly have a highly motivating debt. Motivation is one thing. Intelligence and uh, direction is another. So they, they've got the second to, I've got the first. Mm -hmm. And um, well, you ran through a lot of things to think about. Uh, can we digress or progress a little bit and give me just a slice uh, of a description of a day in the life of a commercial fisherman? In Bristol Bay? Yeah. Okay, so what we're allowed to fish based on the biology of the run. We have area managers and they determine the maximum sustainable yield. So they'll see how many fish are in a river system at one time and they'll say, okay, there's 10,000 fish. Of those 10,000, we need 5,000 to get up the river. So I figure if we open it for five hours, 5,000 fish will get up the river and you guys can take the other five. So I'm gonna open it from 5 a.m. till 10 a.m. Okay, ready, go. So for five hours, we get to fish, and that's just an abstract number. That's not real, and those numbers are not real. I'm just giving you an example of how it's managed. It's based on biology and window openings to take advantage of our ability to take the maximum sustainable yield. So you're fishing, and sometimes the fish are just in one area, a really small area. And so you're all forced to compete in close quarters to get these fish because they don't line up and take numbers like at an ice cream store. They're yeah. trying to get up the stream to go, go do their jobs. And your job is to intercept them. So it can be absolutely crazy in, in how quick things happen and how fast the fish move through. So you have to have your gear properly maintained. You have to have your crew well-fed, rested, right attitude. Um, 
it's it's just everyone's operating at peak levels. Did you did you ever see the <laughs> kind of like filmmaking? Did you ever see the film <laughs> Spinal Tap? You said at six o'clock in the morning, and you know you got so much light, and there's a client there, and exactly right. It rained pretty quickly, and your talent's got a hair problem, and you know you got to make it happen. You can't tell the fish I'm tired. Wait, I'll be back in four hours. It's like mm -hmm. Spinal Tap. Remember the movie Spinal Tap yeah. when the the amplifiers got 11. The guy goes, well, why, why do you have 11? He goes, well, it's one more than 10, isn't it? And that's what Bristol Bay is like. It's always at 11. Everything's 11. Mm -hmm. It's just extreme. And so you have to be prepared for the extreme. Spare parts, spare nets, uh, plenty of food, and still things go crazy. And, and because things happen so quickly, and, and because it's such a compressed fishery, if you have a breakdown or if somebody gets hurt, one tenth of your year's earnings could be gone if you miss one day's fishing. So it's a crucible. You really have to stay focused and be prepared. And a lot of people are, they don't function well with that sort of thing, but I'm so old and I've done it so for so long that for me, it's second nature. That doesn't mean I don't get frustrated when things go sideways because I do and they do, but I try to anticipate as much as I can and have contingency plans in place. So it's a chess game while you're doing battle, if that makes sense. It's a mental battle as much as it's a physical battle. Mm -hmm. um, tell, me about, tell me about the sockeye themselves. I mean, we went into that a little bit, but they're really unique creatures and they, come, they, they go away looking a little different than they come back. And what is their life cycle? Well, there's different, that's a good question. I was just on the phone with some biologists today. There's different ways they come back like some of them will stay inside the river system for two years and then they'll go out in fresh water for one year and come back some of them will go or go out in the ocean some of them will stay in the fresh water for one year and then go out in the ocean for three years so it's a three four year cycle and they go out as little fry and they come back as six to nine pound beautiful chrome blue backed amazing fish just they're just I just get chills thinking about it. They're just wonderful, wonderful species to be involved with. They, they are, they're vital, they're hardy. And when they get into fresh water, they start to lose that chromy color. All of their energy now isn't going into feeding anymore. It's going into trying to go up to spawn and uh, create the next generation. So they'll start to lose their color. They'll start, or they'll start to lose their chrome and they'll turn red and they'll develop a hump on their back. And they, uh, they just kind of transform in front of you. And, and it's no different than, than a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's just as beautiful. Different outcome. They don't fly, they float. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I've been there in places like the Brooks River, you know, and you see a run of salmon, and they're usually followed by brook trout or something like that on some of the rivers. So there's a bunch of species that kind of interoperate in, in the same Eat state. on the eggs, you bet. Symbiosis, yep. Mm -hmm. Can you just explain a little bit about like what you see, what it, what it looks like when everything's going off? You know, you've got bears and birds and 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 trout and salmon and. I think I mentioned it. It's uh, it's nature's perfect. It's perfect. Everything is perfect up there. The birds that flock in the light and it's dark and then it's light and at the same time you're seeing a whale jump. And then at the same time, the seals are feeding along your net as the fish are jumping and the light's absolutely amazing. It's just nature, nature at its perfect height. It's, everything is perfect as it should be. How can we interrupt that? How can we change that in any what that, conscience? What does that do for your soul? I mean, does that give you like the feeling of like... I told you, I, yeah. I can make a living doing... Sometimes I ask you twice because there's a couple of different ways to say it, you know, and you're, you're really doing well. And I love the emotion that you have about it and the description, you know, I mean, you read the great nature writers, you know, and they're talking about, you know, it's, it's the feeling of the participation and the understanding of things. And I, I think that's just wonderful about what you're saying. It's just an agreement. What's the I, agree I agree to respect the area. It nourishes me. How long are you going to keep doing it? I have a 13-year-old son. I'm dying with my boots on. So I can't quit. 
How old are you now? Uh, dog years or human years? 59. You're, you're a little younger than I am. So we've, we've had a lot of the same view of land and changes and things like that. Yeah. No, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm not going to apologize for being emotional. It, it's a special spot. And I wish people could just feel what I get to feel for two and a half months a year, just for a day, just for a day to understand why people do this and, <laughs> and go there. It's just, I am just honored to be there. Mm -hmm. Gosh, you know, I don't know what more to ask you. I mean, you just gave me your heart and soul. So it's not really about information, you know, necessarily. It's a, it's a very emotional time. The record of decision by the Army Corps of Engineers is due out any day. And it's a thumbs up or thumbs down whether the mine gets the permit. And it's been such a corrupt system. We are all just on pins and needles right now, all of us. Well, I was going to ask you about that. So that's the one question I didn't ask you. What's, what's going to happen? Because you mentioned any day Army Corps is going to approve or disapprove. If they approve, is that the end of the, the decision making? Or does that mean it's okay to just go ahead and put it into, you know, contract or construction or however? That... Uh, it's, it's the first step of getting the spades into the ground and starting to turn the soil. And what it gives them is the right to go out and find investors, which is all they oh. want. They're just trying to get the money to pump it up and dump it out. They're not right. going to develop this. They have no financial way to develop this mine, but it gives them their, it gives them their golden ticket. Then they're out. How do they get the billions on a basis of a PowerPoint? Well, it's called forward looking statements. Everything that they do, they're not responsible for factually because they preface it with, this is a forward looking statement. I just, I mean, this is a sci-fi movie. Yeah. Um, so does it really fall in the lap of the White House and our current president? I mean, is there any thought of executive order moving this forward or um, the approval in the interim between the new administration or uh, how, how is that political reality affecting this? That's a good question. We had discussions about that today with a lawyer and the, the thought is the record of decision, they might hold off on the record of decision until the Biden administration comes in because if they issue it now with the Trump administration who leans heavily towards the mine development, and the, the Biden administration comes in, he can change that. So it would just be a whole waste of time and energy and a, and a big public, uh, well, it would, be, it would be a scene. We would like it to be a scene. I'd rather not have it. But what they're trying to do is balance what they get long-term versus the short-term benefits. And I think the Pebble Mine would rather not have it in the news right now because it's not popular. Um, so I think that what, what probably is going to happen is they're going to wait till after Biden comes in. And then they'll probably, I'm hoping, probably deny the permit and then it goes to lawyer land. So we don't have permanent protections. We've got, we've got short-term protections with the Clean Water Act that we can go after. There's, we're trying to get permanent protections. Mm -hmm. so. so why is it that you think the Army Corps will deny it? Well, I think, did you see, or have you heard of the Pebble Tapes, a series of 13 tapes by investors that, or uh, by investigators that that posed as investors, did you happen to see those? It was in the New York Times this morning. Okay, absolutely damning, absolutely incriminating. Every single single thing that the Pebble Limited Partnership and Northern Dynasty said is out in the open. They say one thing, they do another, and so that that's a big thing. They don't want to see that out in public, or uh, they don't want they don't want to admit that. That, that actually happened. The, they had a fall guy take off, Tom Collier, and they brought it back up. But right now, I think if they try to push it through with the pebble tapes out in front and with the DeFazio investigation now, uh, based on the false claims to Congress, there's no benefit to Pebble Limited doing that right now. I think that they can just fade back into the background a little bit and uh, 
they'll, they'll take that no and then they'll keep fighting. They'll go to lawyer land and keep fighting. Mm -hmm. Do you have any information, any inside information on, on their activities or plans? I mean, are there, do you have mutual friends who they happen to go drinking with or anything? Or is it, is it pretty much? I have no, I have absolutely no inside, no inside information. I've done, I've, I've worked on the other side of that fence. I don't want to go near it. Sure. So I, I, I work with lawyers. I work with other activists. And all we can do is work from conjecture and best guesses. So we, we have no inside knowledge. Mm -hmm. Where did the money come from? Well, interesting question. There were a number of initial investors, Rio Tinto, First Quantum, a number of large mining companies, and they've all looked at it. They heard from the natives and they walked away. So $500 million here, $250 million there were put up. And they said, the, the bigger mining companies said, yeah, this isn't going to work. We've done this enough we made a mistake. That's where the money came from. So right now they're trying to find money wherever they can. They're turning over every rock they can to try and find 10 million here, 20 million there, just to keep it pumped up enough to sell that permit if they get it. Well, you mentioned- Remember, they, they have no skill at developing a mine and they have no money to do it either. So it's a blatant pump and dump scheme. You mentioned Rio Tinto and they don't have the best ethical or environmental track record or human rights track record either. No, they don't. But, what I've read. But at least they walked away. Yeah. Well, you know, in the, even I, I know some would consider them the bad guys environmentally. So even the bad guys are walking away. Yeah, even the black hats are turning around. So what are the, um, mechanisms by which uh, theoretically it would all be approved and they get everything they wanted. Uh, are you asking me what the worst case scenario is? Is that exactly. what you just asked? Mm -hmm. They get the permit, they win the court fight, and they put the mine in. And then they turn the, the pebble mine into a mining district. Right now they've got 3,000 acres that they want to exploit. But once they put the roads in, then they can keep leapfrogging it up throughout the whole watershed. And uh, it, would, it would take away all of the Alaska subsistence, it would take away the native way of life, take away the commercial fishing. And remember, I'm vice president for a marketing firm for our fish. Our marketing involves sustainability, pristine habitat. The minute we have any kind of anything, all of our marketing is gone. Everything, it's complete. Our valuation of our fishery drops in half at best. So it's, it's, it's a real threat on a number of levels. So we don't, have, we don't have to wait 10 or 15 years to start seeing impacts in the ocean to the fish and the levels of fish dropping and those kinds of things, which I presume would take a little, a little bit of time. I think you would have to wait some time, honestly, to see some direct yeah. effects on the fish um, from the tailings dams. But it doesn't mean it wouldn't directly affect our market price and our right. marketability. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there goes your industry. The damage is, the damage is done economically, not necessarily environmentally, but the environmental damage is to come. Yeah, it's like just taking the hose on the sandcastle and taking out the footings and just taking us out from below. Exactly. So what we have here is like what happened on the Elwha too. You had, um, you had the investors wanting to put in dams to create power for one, for one destination, which was the Bremerton Navy Yard. Right. And, uh, and they, they sacrificed everything for that. So basically, uh, and that also impacted the commercial fishery, which was lively and was tribal and, uh, and non-tribal at that time. And, and uh, it was a case of one industry really battling another industry. Yeah, it's trade-offs. Trade-off, trade-off. Another instance of environmental alcoholism. It'll be different but it won't, it never will be. And like I mentioned earlier, I just think that uh, you really need to decide to take a stand on something in your life. If, you're, if you are a human being, you have passion and you need to exercise that passion in a positive way. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've done it on a number of levels for different things, but this is the fight of my life right now because of the people that I've been involved with, because of the land I've been able to make a living with, 
it's it's the fight of my life and i'd like for your listeners and your viewers to feel that and to help out as much as they can and to write to their senators and their congress people and say hey i just heard this lunatic talking about this place that seems crazy to develop how can this happen so I'm asking for help. I'm asking for help from people all the way across the country. And I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care what you are. You're an American. And, and this is a travesty of American justice to have a foreign mine com company come in, exploit that resource, ruin the pristine habitat and ecosystem, and then walk away with forever mitigation costs put upon a land that they just ruined. I need help. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll talk again. I'd love to work with you uh, as we go along. And I, I really feel, uh, you know, camaraderie and shared, shared purpose in this after my experience as well, because it just looks like it's in a hundred years, it's kind of only yeah. got worse. And we're talking to all these students and then I tell them about the LWA and I turn, I turn around again and say, it's happening again. You know, and that shocks the hell out of me. It's sad to say. Yeah, I, I was trying to change things then, you know, and you're trying to change things now. And we're essentially well, fighting exactly the same fight. We're doing it slowly but surely. Just just by you making this film is, is giving an awareness that's going to shine some light. And that light is what's going to change things. We need to keep the light on things.